And mm -hmm. I know Sarah Downs will not be here. I had, don't think I had heard from Alaire that she wouldn't, or mm -hmm. Ted. Is Ted? It's not, not yet. No. But as you note, um, you do have a quorum. So if you wanted to get started. Yeah, let's do. Let's call the order and... Uh, if others join, then we'll just make note of that. <clears throat> Great. Um, so we'll start with our um, round robin introductions. Uh, I am remiss in not changing my name here, so I'll do that. Um, and I'll just kick us off. I'm Lindsay White. I'm with the Mrs. Gway River Basin Association. I use she, her pronouns. And I am a voting member. Um, Dan, why don't you go next? Okay, and Sheely from Richford. I'm a voting member also. Bridget. Good morning, everybody. I'm Bridget Butler. I'm the executive director for Friends of Northern Lake Champlain. I use she, her pronouns. And I'm new, so I don't know if I'm a voting member or not. I'm here to <laughs> absorb today as an alternate. <laughs> Kent's shaking his head at me. No, you don't get to vote yet. <laughs> Great. Uh, Barry. Uh, morning, everyone. Barry Lampke. I am the representative, voting representative from Northwest Regional Planning Commission. Uh, pronouns he, him. Kent. Hi, Kent Henderson, chair of the Friends of Northern Lake Champlain, voting member. Jake. Jake Kucher uh, from Westfield, uh, alternate for municipalities, I believe, non-voting. Maddie. Good morning, Maddie Endo, she, her pronouns. Um, usually staff assisting uh, Dean with the quiz. Today I am uh, submitting an application. Sarah. Hi, I'm Sarah. I'm the Eco AmeriCorps member with uh, NRPC. Ellen. Hi, I'm Ellen Fox. She, her pronouns. I am the alternate for the MRBA and a non voting member. Beth. Hi, Beth Torpy, a voting member from Northeastern Vermont Development Association, she, her. Lauren. I am Lauren Weston. I'm the district manager for the Franklin County Natural Resources Conservation District. I use she, her pronouns. I'm actually at our um, annual meeting today, so I'm going to be video on and video off and uh, participating as I am able. I apologize. Thanks for the heads up and thanks for double dipping. Jim. Jim Peace, are you able to speak in? Maybe not. I think that might be his AI assistant and not um, Jim. Oh, Usually he has two profiles if he's on. Great. Okay. That's what the chat was. Uh, okay. Uh, and uh, Julie, sorry, I'm not misremembering how to say your name, so please correct me. July, Julie. I believe she goes by Julie, and she okay. works for St. Albans Town as their okay. stormwater coordinator, but. All right. Well, Dean, why don't you wrap us up? Sure. Um, Dean Pierce, staff, he, him pronouns. And I think that uh, I thought that I saw Jim Peace logged in. So maybe he's logged in and is logged out and is trying to get back in. But we will see. Of course, so. <clears throat> well, as... If other folks join, we'll just make an announcement so it's recorded um, as we're moving through the agenda. Uh, just quick overview of our Zoom norms. Um, 
please do try to keep your camera on and, and stay engaged as much as possible. I understand that we're all crazy busy and running in a billion different directions. And um, if you need to turn your camera off, that's that's fine. But um, we do have a, a vote today, so it would be great to have people fully engaged as possible. Um, we're pretty informal here, but you know, we'll we'll call on people as as you raise hands, but also um, feel free to speak up uh, and. Um, especially if I haven't noticed that your hand is raised, I'll do my best to pay attention to that and pay attention to chat if folks aren't able to uh, speak in. Feel free to enter things in the chat and I'll be monitoring that. Uh, please keep yourself muted unless you're speaking. I will try to do that as well. Um, and then we'll always, we're always good at reminding each other to unmute if we forget. I think that's all. On to the next. And, and Lindsay, if I, if I may just interject very quickly, I, I'm going to do something of a public service announcement for Lauren, because I'm realizing now um, she and I had communicated about whether her consultant would be here. And I thought I had told her to have them pencil it in, but are they are they here or not? Or... Um, none of them were able to make it, so I am prepared okay. to speak okay. towards what they did um, okay. Okay. at a preliminary level. And if there's additional questions, I will bring it back. Um, okay, thank you. I yeah, wanted to apologies. just no, that's that's great. Um, sorry about that interruption. Great. Um, are there any conflict of interest disclosures? Anyone feels the need to bring up? Um, I have a conflict of interest today in that I have a proposal on the table. Great. Um, Kent? Um, I'm wondering if concerning the replacement of Tom Brizzledon as my alternate with uh, Bridget Butler, um, I'm assuming that I should recuse myself from that vote. Yeah, that sounds like a great plan. Thanks, Kent. Um, we should still have a quorum with that. Um, I will also disclose that I'm involved in a uh, proposal that's on the table. So that's my conflict. Any others? Okay. I, I guess I would just say the the notes will show or the record will show that that earlier in this meeting we had noted that Barry will need to recuse himself because the Regional Planning Commission is an applicant for the project that Maddie will be speaking to. Maddie, of course, isn't a voting member. Great. Um, <clears throat> so we'll do uh, any adjustments or uh, approval of the agenda. So if there are any adjustments, please speak now. If not, I'll seek a motion to approve. Kent? Oh, I was trying to vote on the motion, or, or I okay. can make the motion. If, it, if a motion needs to be made, I'll make it. Uh, that would be great. Kent has made a motion. Is there a second to approve the, the agenda? Second. That's Beth seconding that. Okay, all voting members in favor, please say aye or raise your hand. I see Lindsay, Dan, Kent, Barry, Beth, Alaire. Okay. And there's Lauren. Um, great. So that is a, an agenda approved. I'm just gonna get Alair to just, uh, she's joined us to just uh, do a quick hi, and let us know you're here and give us the intro. We do have a couple new faces, so. Great, yeah, sorry I'm late um, everybody. My name's Alair Diamond. Um, I'm a voting member. I am an ecologist with Vermont Land Trust and um, I live in Jericho, but work in the Missisquoi Basin all the time. Okay. Thank you. Um, and Karen Bates has also joined, if you don't mind doing an intro, Karen. Karen, are you there? Okay. 
okay, maybe not. So we can move on to um, minutes from the last meeting. Uh, Dean had sent these out. So um, if you have any comments, now is the time. Otherwise, I'll seek a motion to approve the minutes from someone, from one of the voting members. So moved. That's Beth. Motioning to approve the minutes from our last meeting. Is there a second? Dan is seconding, Alaire is seconding. <laughs> okay, so uh, all in favor of accepting the minutes as written. Voting members, please say aye or indicate somehow. We've got Lauren, Lindsay, Dan, Kent, Beth, Barry, and Alaire. Thank you guys. Now is the time for public comment not related to any items on the agenda. Speak up if you have any comments. Hearing none, we'll move on to seating of new reps or alternates as needed. So Kent or Bridget or Dean, one of you want to speak to this? I will jump in. Um, yes, the request was submitted by Friends of Northern Lake Champlain. Uh, now that Bridget Butler has become the executive director of Friends, um, to have Bridget serve as the alternate, um, taking the place of Tom Brizolden. Great. Welcome, Bridget. Um, any discussion or I'll accept a motion. So moved. Thanks, Beth. Beth is motioning to approve this new uh, seating of an alternate, Bridget Butler, as an alternate for Friends of Northern Lake Champlain. Is there a second? I see a layer. Okay, so all in favor of having Bridget become the new alternate for Friends of Northern Lake, please voting members indicate. I see Lauren, Barry, Lindsay, Dan, Beth, and Alaire. All right, Kent has recused himself. That is uh, a majority, it's, it's an everybody. So welcome Bridget. <laughs> Okay, next up, we've got funding application project reviews. Dean, take it away. Thank you, Lindsay. And apologies in advance for any um, coughs that I don't manage to mute myself from uh, sharing. Uh, the packets for this meeting included a cover memo with recommendations that came from me as a QISP staff person. It included the application forms. Those, of course, come from the applicant. Um, scoring sheets, those came from me. And application materials, those came from the applicants. And what I thought um, would happen this morning is that I would just give a few brief remarks, and then there could be presentations made of the applications by the applicants, and then there could be book discussion and action on them. Um, if that's OK, uh, I would pretty much limit my results to what people I'm hoping are able to see on this table um, on the screen now. And I think people can see that. But there were two applications. They're in separate categories. So this time around, there are no there's no ranking or competition. And I guess I just want to make sure also Lauren's hand is still, it's carried over, right? Lauren, if you're able to say that that's yeah. just a carryover. Yes, okay. that's carryover. Apologies. No, yeah, no, that's good. Um, so they're in separate categories. And so although projects were scored, they're, it's not possible to rank because the rank is one of one. Um, applicants were the Northwest Regional Planning Commission collaborating with uh, MRBA. That request was in the neighborhood of $45,000. The short title, I'm calling it 
is using the functioning floodplain initiative tool to identify projects in the Minnesisquoi Basin. It's similar to an earlier application uh, previously approved by the Basin Council. And my recommendation is that it be approved. Um, it did get scored under the project development uh, system, which is a fairly simple crude system, and it got 27 out of 32 points, is, which is comparable to some of the others that have been that have been given funded in the past. I will just say that I had no part in preparing the application. Um, and so in uh, terms of the QUISP staffing, I, I, I appreciate Maddie's comments earlier. Her uh, she's an employee of the Regional Planning Commission, as I am. My duties are primarily related to the work of the QUISP and the BWIC. Maddie's are, are not necessarily primarily. And she, um, like I said, had no, I had no involvement with her in preparing this application. So our plan as an organization for the time being, especially since this application doesn't require the, the council to choose one over the other, um, we're comfortable submitting these score results with a recommendation. Um, if that needs to change in the future, then it needs to change in the future. The uh, second application that was received for a design project was submitted by Lauren and the Natural Resources Conservation District. Um, it's on the order of $109,000. It's for a final design project. Uh, on Trout Brook, not to be confused with the Trout River, um, for a uh, dam removal project. And that project application was also scored. Um, it got 87 out of 100 points. The cost effectiveness ratio based on the estimated total, total cost was in the neighborhood of just shy of $15,000 per kilogram, which is roughly comparable to the the historic average, the data that we have for cost effectiveness for projects is a few years old now, but if you average those, that is, it is within the ballpark of the average cost. Um, I think that's where I'm going to leave it. Uh, again, like with the first application recommendation was to approve it. Um, and at this point, I was just going to turn things over to the applicants. I know that Maddie has said she has a short slideshow so if it pleases the council then i'll just turn turn the floor over to her okay um i assume i can share my screen oh dean can you enable me to share there we go I have lost my name. Okay. I'm assuming everyone can see this. So uh, this application is for the functioning floodplain initiative tool um, to identify some projects within the Mississippi River Basin area. Um, it would be a collaboration between NRPC and MRBA. Um, some of our uh, important tasks would be using the tool after we are, um, get more familiar with it um, and going through some preliminary mapping and prioritization, um, doing landowner re outreach, and then some site visits to actually um, verify that the tool is identifying areas that are a priority. Um, we would consult with the DC and do some regulatory reviews and then also um, take a look at cost effectiveness, design life, and O&M um, needs. And we would do the same project screening forms and get these potential projects to a point where they can be individual projects for the next round of funding. 
So we're aiming for 10 to 14 projects. And right now we have it um, split up where NRPC would focus on the municipalities of Highgate, Swanton, Fairfield, Franklin, Sheldon, Montgomery, Enosburg and Bakersfield. So the Western portion of the basin. And then MRBA would focus on the Eastern portion. So Jay, Troy, North Troy, Newport Town, Westfield, Lowell, Richford, Montgomery and Berkshire. Um, and we also are aware that um, other work with the tool is being done for riparian plantings. Um, so we will not be doing those for Franklin County area. Um, overall, our budget is around $45,000. It would start as soon as possible and go until the end of next year. And looking at um, kind of the general uh, scope of what what the BWIC would be authorizing, would or the QUIS would be paying for, uh, for every 10,000 spent about two or three projects would be identified depending on if we end up with 10 or 14 projects. So it'd be in the range of 32K to 45K or 4,500. Um, and again, the 14 total. Oops, I'm looking, having you one slide behind. Sorry. <laughs> um, but I guess that that kind of is all. I'm happy to take questions if needed. Yeah, I have a question. And I think you you did say this, Maddie, but if you could just repeat, when you say identified for each of those projects identified, um, that is that more detailed than that, like the you're going to do the FFI um, work and then the, can you just, just name again kind of what that means for each of those? Yeah, so I think generally our idea is the tool would identify, I don't know how many projects, potential list of very many projects. Yeah. Um, and in the end, we're hoping to move forward with 10 to 14. With what, and then so the deliverables for this would be that you would, you'd have like some kind of write up about them where you would have gone through the, the more detailed analysis and the landowner. Yeah. So we would them. go through the landowner's um, support and look at cost effectiveness and design life and have like some draft O&M ideas going. And so those projects would be ready to be individual projects in the watershed project database so that they can be picked up either by NRPC or MRBA again to do each individual project for either concept design or if it is a simpler project, go right towards construction to actually implement the project in the future so we'd get those prepared for whatever the next next round would be okay so they would be entered into the the watershed project database yes. but you wouldn't you wouldn't necessarily have like a a set like design um product or a budget or a scope or anything like that for those mm, i guess it depends on the project and what we identify because a, an easement wouldn't necessarily have that sort of thing. Yeah, they all have um, to, yeah, totally. But you would have landowner outreach, good, yeah, mm -hmm. great. Um, and I don't know who was next, Kent or Karen, but- Kent was next. Okay. Okay, I'll jump in. <laughs> this is really exciting. Um, and we, our organization uh, is trying to learn how to use this FFI and we're working in similar areas and really looking forward to cooperating with findings. And I'm really excited about uh, having more projects be brought to us. And this is great to be doing this investigation. Um, as the historical examinations uh, keep being pushed um, closer to the start of projects, 
uh, applications. I was wondering if that will be included in the 10 to 14 projects that you are uh, going to be maybe going into a little more depth and uh, presenting that we can carry on with. Um, I think it's something that we can consider. Um, our task list has like project review kind of twice. Um, so when we whittle down to those last 10 to 14, we might have some opportunity to do the historic preservation research um, and outreach, but it isn't currently a like a set task, but it I feel like it can be. Yeah, I'm sure there's some areas that are more sensitive than others. I participated in that Basin 5 discussion and they flashed up before us a map that the historical folks uh, use in their investigations to zero in on certain areas, but that's highly guarded information. And when I asked for it to help direct my searches, I was told, no, uh, you're not you're not cleared to use that. Um, but I think it would be really good uh, you know, especially right beside these uh, water bodies to uh, have that. So thanks very much. Mm -hmm. Aaron? Hi. So the one thing that's always, you know, complicated is figuring out the, the project category. And project development is generally was meant for just sort of like getting to the point where you were ready to do the next step, which um, would be project design maybe like 30 percent um and it looks like you you would have enough information here that you could go to a, it was you know like easement that you could go ahead and start with uh a project that would be defined as you know river corridor easement project category um do you in your understanding of project development versus um project design are you doing anything more are you doing what should be included in project design uh and um yeah what do you see the difference between project design and uh project development i guess um i think i would have to double check with the spreadsheet to make sure that i am not dipping my toes into project design too much, but I was pretty confident in going into this that it was a project development type project since we are using that tool um, as a resource to identify the projects. And that's how we presented it in uh, the end form to get an ID for the watershed project database. So I think that's where we feel that the project is yeah, you you know, with the end form, because I, of course, approved it, it was a very sort of vague project sort of using the FFI to identify water quality projects. And so in my mind, it was basically sort of a high level. Yeah, we should be doing buffer planting here, easement here, um, and so on. And I guess the only thing that would be interesting, because this is a whole new world, and we want to encourage creativity in identifying projects, but I provided that overview of, of assessment tools to sort of give you an example of how the agency has put a lot of effort into developing a process to making sure that priority projects come out of the assessments. And we haven't we haven't had FFI before. And to use that and um, to identify projects, you're sort of creating the process. And uh, the prioritization, we don't know how you're prioritizing. So you're creating the prioritization process. And um, I guess it's maybe something to take note that yeah it's 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 your own process and that's different from the other processes that uh maybe we've supported in the past and there'll be some risk because of that mm -hmm. i think we acknowledge that the tool is new so there isn't guidance already provided to us and so we know that it's an exploratory process since we have this new tool and we want to utilize it. And maybe one day it is one of those listed resources in the assessment category. But for now, I think this is how it's got to go. 
Yeah, no, no, the FFI will never be a process. The FFI is a tool. And so then a process has to be developed around it um, for actually identifying the project and and prioritizing, making sure it can happen. So I think that's important to to understand, or you know, for the group to understand. And that process is what you're creating outside of just having an FFI tool, but also step ones, two, and three, you know. Um and I had, um, and then I guess the other question is, so Dan Albrecht with Basin 5 had uh, supported a similar assessment, um, although they were going to focus on existing uh, practice or projects in stormwater ge um, geomorphic assessment corridor plans, as well as stormwater plans. And so, the the idea was to to use some of the data existing data that had been gathered as part of the process and you haven't included that in your project description and i wondered if that was your idea as well for how to sort of narrow down project ideas i think at this time we're focusing on using the new tool that's out there um i feel like it's possible that some of the reaches that we do identify, then we'll go back and investigate if needed, if there was previous work done. But I don't think that was a a main portion of our um, schedule. You have a, um, a support letter from Stacy Pomeroy supporting sort of your approach in using the FFI? No, and not that you need one. But again, that's just, you know, this is all new. Uh, we don't have a letter yet, but I know we've talked in the past about using the tool and she seemed supportive. So um, we can certainly reach out to her again. Yeah, we had provided some like additional information you could put in the project description because we did like the idea of following um, you know, maybe starting with Dan's approach since it was a known a known process. Um, but yeah, but she didn't say that your process wasn't one that was going to work. No, we haven't heard that. And we took a look at Dan's proposal, um, as you had mentioned, but we mostly looked at um, the Franklin County District's proposal that went in and was approved, I think, back in May. And so we did a very similar approach to what was approved then so that the three entities could end up working together um, and making sure that our process is similar. And we have um, a task to kind of have a work group to do that. Well, you've certainly got yeah. strong players here. Um, I think maybe Dean, Lauren, I don't want to skip over you, but you had your hand up, I think, for an additional question. I think Dean maybe had a, a reaction to this conversation. So I wanted to make sure to give. I, I just wanted um, to, um, yeah, just get a little bit of a clarification from what Karen is saying. Is is it because what I'm hearing is what sounds like a concern about calling this project development rather than assessment. Is that fair to say, Karen? Uh, just making sure that it, it fits in that um, project development is so wide open uh, that it could possibly fit. And I know the project description that I got was vague enough that um, it had some sense that it, you were going to be pro providing less than you do now. So uh, I was I'm actually still looking for the <laughs> description of project description um, and we don't have an assessment for this, because this is new, you know? And so um, I I think um, that, I think the only thing that I wanted to just let the group know is that this assessment process is new. And I agree that we need to be creative. It doesn't really fit neatly into any one category. And the, and the, the protocols, the processes are what you all will be developing um, to make sure that the FFI tool is used in a way effectively to um, 
you know, with the, with the FFI tool, it's not the only process that's used, FFI I tool. Um, yeah, and yeah, so that's it, just. Okay, so I, I guess, um, Lindsay, the, the, the reaction I would give from the standpoint of the QISP staff is that I think there's a really good argument to be made that the FFI tool is in fact an assessment and that an assessment has been done and there are applications like this one and the others that are easily classified as project development. Um, I, I don't need to belabor it, but GIS is a tool. Um, it's software that we can use to combine layers of data um, and do assessments. The FFI is essentially a geographic information system where a lot of data has been pulled together and conclusions can be drawn based on it. And, and so I do think an argument can be made that it is an assessment and so that some of this is maybe not that big a deal as far as what is the question before you since it has been put in the database as a project development or project and an argument could conceivably be made that it it's based on an assessment that is the FFI. Thanks, Dean. Uh, looks like Ellen, maybe you also had a uh, reaction. Oh, you're muted, Ellen. Thanks. Um, just an observation that the assessment tools that we've been using you know, over the years are um, robust. They've created a large database of possibilities. Um, I think one thing to note about this project is that it's sort of a, a that transition to more uh, local prioritization. Um, you know, that assessment tool that we've been using has not really yielded a, a whole, you know, pile of projects that we see here. And so this is an attempt to, you know, add that extra layer of uh, landowner outreach, you know, a priority list with also a combination of what locally is possible. So that, yeah, on the one hand, uh, it's right on the border between development and design, but not quite yet into design. So sort of like right up to that edge, if you will, but, but just an observation. Thanks, Ellen. Lauren, did you want to weigh in on this as well? Um, I just have like a, a more separate comment. And I think I'd mentioned this to you and Maddie before, but just want to make sure that it's like totally allowable, um, just the partnership component and how um, that's going to work from the, the quiz perspective. If it's really like the NRPC hiring MRBA or just wanting to make sure that like the process is kosher from the um, CRISP perspective. Yeah, um, I'm happy to jump in if that's okay. The, the, the are different ways that this could be sliced. One would be that there were two applications submitted and and basically the work was divided into and we wouldn't we wouldn't have to worry about this question um i'm not thinking that it's necessary to do that given that both participating organizations are pre-qualified part partner organizations i think similarly you know the um Conservation District did something of a teaming. Oh, sorry. Uh, I do have to sign for a package. Um, so I'll come back in five seconds, if that's okay. Great. Well, Dean stepped away. Karen, do you have other concerns or um, questions that you wanted to bring up? Um, I would, you know, I, I do think it's it's important to include uh, Stacy in uh, the support of this project. Stacey Pomeroy, and um, that there be, if there are conditions that the book wants to to, to consider, uh, that she 
yeah, somehow there would be some her support her support in some way. So because she did say I can uh, can provide what she said in the chat, which uh, I thought I had forwarded to them. Uh, you know, it gets me. Oh, here we are. She said, thanks for the heads up. This needs to be looked at at stuff beyond just the FFI. I would want them to use a lot, use, utilize the RCP so the river corridor plans and other data to help look at where project types of projects. It may be helpful to talk with Dean, MRBA, Lauren, TNC, as I understand they were funded to do some project IUD work too. Are they only looking at buffer plantings to see which group is doing which part of basin and make sure we have some consistencies and approaches? So I think, you know, she's just wanting she she recognizes that, that you know Franklin County NRC D is going to be involved and um, they've got some background as well, but just having a supporting yeah, and I think we want to learn from the process as well. Yeah, Stacy does. I, I just want to address a that. Lot from you guys, that I think that that was definitely the goal. Uh, Maddie and I collaborating and also Lauren, you know, it's definitely a, a way for us to work together to make sure that there's consistency across the watershed and to learn more about using this FFI tool and how that relates to ground truthing on, on the ground, realistic conversations with landowners. So definitely uh, something we're interested in, but, but a high priority of this project development work was working together. So we're all using the same methods. Great. Uh, Dean, did you want to? Yeah, sorry about that, folks. Um, this is a package that had already been missed once. Um, so yes, I was starting to say, I think that the situation is different in a case where there are par multiple partner organizations as part of the same application. We are, as a QUISP, we feel that um, the sponsorship is something that doesn't have to be uh, fixed and limited. So in other words, this is essentially a single project that's a vehicle for two organizations to sponsor work. One of them has to be the lead. There'll be the, the money flowing through one of them. It's not something that I imagine that there would have to be two contracts for, but in the event um, that determination is made, then if the funding for the project is approved and we are told that we have to strike two different contracts, then that's what the QUISP will do. I guess I'll leave it at that. To be clear, that's not my concern. No, that was, Lauren brought that up. So oh, okay. Lauren, does that, does okay. that address? Yeah, sorry, sorry, we're a little a little convoluted in our conversation today, mm -hmm. but Lauren, that, that addressed your concern? Okay, I'm getting a thumbs up from Lauren. Thanks, Dean, appreciate that. Any other questions or comments about this application? All right. Seeing none, are we ready to move to a, a vote? I will uh, take a motion, if that's the case. Kent? Oh, you're on mute, Kent. Sorry. <laughs> I so move to adopt this project. Great, thank you, Kent. Is there a second? I will second, this is Lauren. Lauren, okay, Kent has motion, Lauren has seconded. Um, I'm just gonna note for the minutes that I'm recusing myself from this vote, but if other voting members would um, like to weigh in, please raise your hand if you would like to approve that motion. I'm seeing Dan, Beth, Alaire, Lauren. I'm recusing myself. Oh, Kent. Oh, yes. I'm Barry. Yes. As previously noted, thank you, Barry. Um, Barry's also recusing himself as one of the uh, parties on the application. So we had just to recap Dan, Kent, Beth, Lauren, and Alaire. That's our vote. That does fit the quorum. So uh, motion is approved. Thank you all. On to the next.
Implication. Uh, Do you need to share, Lauren? You should, I think, should be able to. I, it doesn't look like I can. Um, I'll share a little bit. Um, it's too many things open. It doesn't recognize the one I actually want first. Uh, apologies, folks. Trying to do 40 things at the same time. All right. So um, I already applied for funds to move a dam removal to final design. It's the Trout Brook Reservoir Dam in Berkshire. It's actually owned by the village of Enosburg Falls. Um, it was previously used in the early 1900s as part of their water supply or mid 1900s as part of their water supply. It has since been replaced with groundwater wells. Um, and we've already done a feasibility study and concept design with SLR this year um, through some funding from VNRC and TNC. And so we've gotten approval from the Village Venusburg Falls to move to final design. Um, we are, we've had regulators out to the site twice, uh, feeling pretty confident that this project will move forward. Uh, as Dean mentioned, the estimated per kilogram cost is around $15,000. Um, that is hopefully um, on the higher end of things. And that's just due to the fact that we might have to end up moving some of their well water supply infrastructure um, to make sure that when we <laughs> take out the dam, um, we're not accidentally wiping out some of their pipes. But um, otherwise it's pretty straightforward dam removal project. Um, let me just pull up a couple other interesting numbers for you. So the the estimated annual um, P credit in kilograms per year is forty seven point one, which is a pretty pretty good for a project. Um, but please also note that the one time um, phosphorus uh, removal is actually over five thousand kilograms um, because we will be moving sediment out of the the floodplain and out of risky areas to be moved downstream in the um, inevitable failure of this dam. And so- um, Lauren, I, I just to, want to note that we're still seeing the map. That's totally fine. You don't want okay. to see what I'm looking at, trust me. It's a okay. terrifying- I just wasn't sure if you were trying to show us numbers. Great. <laughs> I am, yeah. Um, and so, um, yeah, everything's kind of moving along um, with this project. We are trying to keep it on a pretty um, strict schedule as possible. And so that's why we were excited to present this to the BWIC and to see the high um, phosphorus reduction numbers associated with it. Um, we, there's discussion um, from the Village Venusburg Falls that owns a field next to the dam. Um, and putting a solar installation there potentially in 2025 if everything's in line. And so it would actually be quite um, efficient to do the dam removal before that and to just put the sediment on that uh, raised field as opposed to having to truck it, which is the expensive part of dam removals. Um, and so we are really excited to be presenting this to the board and try to try to get this project to continue moving forward with the um, energy that it does have right now. Um, it, the Village of Venusburg Falls is very much on board with getting this huge um, liability off of their books. And I'll stop sharing my screen and answer any questions. Yeah, Lair. Yeah. I'm always surprised at how just the range of prices for design, like this seems high to me, like you already have the preliminary um, and the final, like to be a hundred thousand, it just seems like a lot. Um, but yeah, don't know the details of the project, obviously. Um, so I guess my question is, would you be look? would you do, be doing a bid process to get that? Or would you just be working with SLR since you're already working with them? Is that, I don't know what's required. I'm working on another project with in a different basin that's funded by BWIC and I have to do a bid process, but it's preliminary design. Um, so curious about what the requirements are for you or your plans. 
yeah so a couple of comments on the the total cost that is projected um we did pull that slr did give us an estimate a quote um so that's what we use plus a 20 percent contingency and so ideally we'll get bids that are lower than our current budget for the final design we did also include funding for the historical um, yeah. and cultural resources which we know is going to be they're going to find yeah. um some things here um just based on what it is and so we we definitely like pat we made sure we had enough funds to do that is how i'm gonna phrase that we also um do believe that we need a muscle survey as there was um there's a rare threat and endangered muscle in this area and they did see some muscle shells but aren't we're not um slr is not muscle experts and so there were a couple of nuances here and really that water supply um making sure that the final design really takes into account that um any impacts to the water supply and so that's why it is a slightly it's a high number um there's also going to be a lot of permits um mm -hmm. The permitting itself is almost thirty thousand um, okay. dollars. It's one. Of, it's one of those projects that's just going to take a lot of permitting money. Um, and then in terms of procurement, it's my understanding, and Dean, you can tell me if I'm wrong, that I do have to go through a bid process. Um, and I don't think we have to go with the lowest bid, but we can. We get to go with the most qualified and. A, efficient bid or something along those lines I was actually planning on if this project got approved just sitting down with Dean and making sure I, I did understand that procurement process from the QUISP yeah Dean Lindsay is it okay that I ask a question as an alternate absolutely Jake yeah let's okay. uh let's have Dean respond to Lauren first but then I'll okay. call on you Jake for sure yeah, thank you um I just wanted to say that there is a path so that for another project or a future project, a partner organization could solicit consultants for design, early stage design, and have it allow them to continue to use the consultant in future phases if those phases are funded. So, so basically, there is a way it can be done. CCRPC has a policy in Basin 5 the Regional Planning Commission, Northwest Regional Planning Commission is actually following that policy for a project that Maddie is working on that is in Basin 5. And we would fully expect to uh, accommodate a similar approach in Basin 6 and 7. So let's, if we were able to turn back the clock and um, Lauren was soliciting uh, bids from consultants to do the work that SLR has, has done, she might have been able to do, she would have been able to do it in a way that gave her the option to continue to work. Uh, and we could talk about that in more detail at some, some point, some future meeting, maybe it deserves discussion, but we'll, um, yes, it, we, we want to be able to do it. So Jake. Okay. My question is, uh, the question is not specifically related to this project, but it's more related to any project that happens in water. Uh, you know, we sometimes hear a measure of how much phosphorus reduction is going to be accomplished by the project. One thing that I think we need to acknowledge as well, and I don't know how you measure it, but there's going to be some phosphorus displacement while the project is happening. That's going to end up uh, right now. A lot of that is probably pretty stable. But when the project is being done, there's going to be a lot of stuff going downstream. And, you know, I'm not saying this as a, as a, uh, by any means, as a criticism of this project, but it just came to my mind when we're talking about these kinds of things that when you're, uh, you've got excavators in the water, there's a bunch of stuff going downstream. So th that's it. That's, that's all. Thank you. Yeah, Jake, totally agree. Um, playing in the stream is, messy um and obviously there are controls but it's still it still is messy and um obviously the goal long term is to create a more stable stream that long term net improves the risk but i totally hear you big yellow machines and streams is always a um, just close your eyes so sometimes <laughs> Yeah. 
Thanks. Um, just to uh, elaborate on that a little bit is a, a project that we're doing right now in Newport with a sort of similar size dam is to actually look at that um, phosphorus pulse. If it, if it happens, you know, we have the advantage of having some pre-monitoring and so uh, to look at depositional environments that occur downstream that have been sediment starved perhaps um, over time and and how that actually moves. So I think that that's actually for me a really exciting part of what we're learning as we do these initial dam removals. I have a question. Um, so who is going to be doing the dam removal? Um, so we have not gotten to implementation to know what contractor or anything like that we would use. I'm just wondering because, I mean, from a liability perspective, somebody put that dam in, so wouldn't they be responsible? Um, not that I, don't get me wrong, I think it's a great project and removing phosphorus and everything, but, you know, uh, to spread the uh, the responsibility. Because the dam removal, I would imagine, would be quite expensive. Um. My understanding is that um, European immigrants had built the dam in the 1920s or so, uh, maybe in the 1940s. And um, I don't think they're coming back <laughs> to take it out. Um, but I hear your point, I think. Who actually owns it right now? The village of Venusburg Falls owns it. Okay, so it's, yeah. their, it's their ultimate liability. Yes. Yeah. And they've, um, the trustees of the village have met with me a couple of times and um, the engineers to get all of their questions answered and be assured that they'd be um, continually involved in the final design process so that any um, potential concerns or issue are uh, ironed out in advance. Okay, thank you. Any other questions about this project for Lauren? Being none, I will seek a motion to move forward on this project. I move to approve. Okay, it's a motion from Allaire to approve. Kent, is that a second? It is a second. Okay, so we've got a motion from Allaire to approve this application. A second from Kent. Any other discussion before we go for a vote? I'm abstaining just for the record. Okay, no more questions. If you're a voting member, uh, in light of uh, Lauren's abstention, Please raise your hand or otherwise indicate if you vote to approve. Got Barry, Lindsay, Dan, Kent, Beth, and Alaire. Great, motion passes. Thank you guys for good uh, proposals and good discussion on them. We're ready to move on to the next part of the meeting, which Dean is um, budget adjustments. Oh, Dean, you are muted. Sorry about that. Um, just was getting a couple of windows organized here. So yes, this is the topic. Hopefully people are able to see the slide. Um, <clears throat> the packets had a staff memo and a proposed policy in them, something for discussion. Um, the gist of the staff memo was that under the the structure created by Act 76, the Basin Councils approve expenditures of funds for, for projects. They approve projects. They say it's worthy. Uh, and the clean water service providers handle procurement and contracting. Um, and so the process is, is complex sometimes, um, complicated. There 
are requests for budget amendments expected um, for a variety of reasons. I expect them happening here. I've seen it happen in, in other basins, which is raising the question, um, how do we handle that? Um, in Basin 5, they had their council had approved a funding for a project, uh, and then that project came back because of something that we will talk about a little bit later, having to do with cultural resources. And there was discussion uh, amongst some of the folks at the Basin 5 Council with their staff, and their conclusion was is that there should be a policy or guidance or guidelines for handling this situation. Um, I, I agree, uh, for the record, I had voted in favor of what was proposed um, at that Basin 5 meeting. Um, I think it helps operate um, the work that it helps the work that we're all trying to do. Um, but I also recognize that the document that I put together, since this has not had internal discussion or a discussion amongst the, the big WIC members, it may be something that takes a little while for it to be settled. Um, I created a document. I started with Basin 5 and I added some, some things to it um that just addressed some questions in my mind what it all boils down to though is what i'm hoping everybody sees in this table here uh, and that is for someone who or an organization that has an approved project uh, and they come back and they say we need to have an adjustment for uh you know the following reason uh, and i i started to go down the road of itemizing what i thought might be the legitimate reasons and then i realized it's going to always be incomplete um and so i stopped but maybe that's something the group wants to discuss but for now if in the view of quisp staff there's a legitimate reason for adjusting the budget for a project one time um, as up to 10 percent, then it could be approved by quisp staff one person in the body of me between 10 and 20 percent in Basin 5, they had um, proposed and, and then adopted something that says that it would be approved so long as QUISP staff and the chair and the vice chair of the council agree that it's justified. But when a request is necessary for more than 20%, then it would have to come in for review and action by the Basin Council. The... Um, I'm going to try to wrap up here quickly. The additions that I am suggesting are just to, to be clear about, well, what happens if the project in question involves the organizations that the chair and vice chair or, or vice chair are part of? And I'm thinking that as long as it would be two other members of the WIC, the same kind of thinking would, would uh, apply. So that's part of the grist for the mill. Um, and also, I just wanted it known that it, in cases where someone requires a budget amendment and it's more than 20 percent, our goal is to get it before the, the Basin Council as quickly as possible so that it doesn't affect the schedule. Um, questions that you may want to just throw out there are, is it a good idea or is there a better way to do it? Um, what would the next steps be? Um, I'm hoping everybody has... Um, text of the um of the document i can pull that up if you don't but um that was all i was going to say and so what i guess i would do is just answer questions oh sorry kent kent had his hand up but i have a question also um I think that's a, I think that um, this is a good idea. We had an issue with um, the Magog Watershed Association where they came upon contaminated soils when they were doing a project and they got left hanging. They got left holding the bag for $160,000 of uh, disposal costs. So um, you don't want nonprofits in the that position. Um, so, um, but, I think also it depends on the size of the project. So if you have a project that's 
$200,000, 10% of that, you know, is $20,000. And if this is something that keeps occurring over and over, it's just something I think we need to pay attention to um, with the, with cost, with cost overruns. And also I'm wondering if there are certain categories that um, people can imagine that would be easier to approve. Um, for example, Lauren mentioned that there, there was, there would be a lot of permitting for uh, the dam removal um, proposal. So I'm just wondering if there are maybe some categories to make it um, that would be easier to approve on your level, Dean. Um, is something kind of like a no-brainer. And also um, there would have to be documentation and due diligence to prove that uh, the, the um, additional money is uh, required. If, if I can just jump in, Lindsay, I, I, I um, think I said, this is a one-time only, so it would not be possible and I apologize if that wasn't clear from the text that's been created, but it it's not my intention for someone to come in and seek a um, an increase and then come back and and just continue to stay under the floor. Um, so they ask for nine percent and then they come back and ask for nine percent again. Well, once they've asked for nine percent the second time, they are over ten percent. So um, that I I just I mean want that. I just no, I, I, I understood that. I mean, like um, different projects, you know, that can add up with different projects, but we don't have that many projects right now. But if the first proposal is successful, we'll have a lot of projects, so. <laughs> right. Um, and then, yeah, I, I think that there, there are certainly, um, there are types of amendments or amendments for certain types of costs that I think we will see more regularly than others. Um, and cultural resources assessment is is one of those areas, so related to consultants. But yeah, this was this is to try to get the ball rolling for what I think in the main is a is a useful idea. The only other thing I forgot to say earlier is that I believe that uh, and people who have had experience with certain grants that are administered by WOV, I believe WOV has a system similar to this where there are some administrative amendments. The difference here and why this is being formalized or proposed to be formalized is that Act 76 and the rule make it clear that the BWIC has to approve the use of funds. And so my thinking or my argument would be that if the WIC adopts this policy, it would be doing two things. It would be retroactively saying for every vote that it's taken and has approved a project, that approval now comes along with this added benefit, basically. And then also going forward, it's a vote that's proactive that says in the event that application needs to have the extra 9%, it could be done administratively and so forth. Um, so anyway, I just it's it's formalized because the rule says the book has to approve all of the expenditures. Go ahead, Kent. And as uh, someone that for the last year has been spending a lot of time on amendments with uh, Nui Pick, uh in particular, um, and on cost overruns of a lot more than 10% uh, when we came back from COVID and I came back a year later on some of these construction costs and I'm, they're almost 100% increase that we're talking about. Um, I'm really, the word simplify is very important to me in Dean's description of what's going on here. Um, I did raise some objections in the Basin 5 discussion that are similar to what Beth just brought up and that the size of the project makes a big difference. You know, if I've got a $300,000 project as opposed to a $25,000 project, and so I was kind of scratching my head over that and is, 
is it appropriate to be talking percentages here or should it be amounts? And I can understand from an administrative point of view why the percentage angle was taken on this, but I think it is, I think it's something we, to, to think about. And then the other part that enters my mind is, do we really have a standard percentage for a contingency uh, that we're putting into our budgets? And I know it kind of varies from organization to organization. Um, there are some where I've been told no more than 10%, some 20%, and I think that jumps around. And I think that um, has that's got an effect here because that's traditionally how we would formulate or how we would come to an understanding of building our budget in the first place. What are the possible overruns that I need to write into a contingency? percentage into my budget and I I don't know how, I do I don't know how to uh, formalize this or put it in policy um, I wish I had a, a really good strong suggestion or action step but I, I'm just raising a question Yeah, if it's okay, I I um I don't recall anyone had suggested in the past having a consistent um percentage for contingency. Um, that's something that can be discussed. I'm uh I'm thinking that it is potentially related to work like this. Um, I guess I'll just I'll put a period on that thought. It's um, it's something that becomes more of an issue, I think. You know, the project that you refer to, Ken, I believe, was one at construction, and that's where the hits can be particularly large for projects that are in design. Um, yeah, projects that are in design, the the hits are usually not as large. Although, you know, with a dam project that Lauren was just describing. It, you know they are they could end up spending quite a bit on the muscle consultant or um, some aspect, even though it's not for construction. But the construction is where it really hits hard, especially. Are there questions related to that, or do other or have folks had other experiences with? other funding sources that might weigh in on figuring out the best method? I mean, I'll just echo like what, what Kat and others were saying, like with Watersheds United, it's really easy to just say, yeah, like we've had a change in the project and need to make a an adjustment to the budget. It happens there and they've just been incredibly responsive and, and quick to just approve it. It takes a couple of days. Um, so I'm glad that we're moving in that direction with this as well. I don't know exactly what their process is behind the scenes, but from the outside, it's it's really smooth and quick. I can speak a little bit to that. I, I serve as the chair of the WUV board, and um, <laughs> it's something that in recent years has become part of the budgeting for WUV is we have this many dollars for grants and we need to reserve some of it for contingencies because we know that that's going to happen more and more often. So, uh, you know, that has to factor in to WOV's overall annual budget and how those grant funds are getting expended out. But, um, you know, it's it's case by case, but there is a pot of money that is generally earmarked for things like this. And then the way WOV accepts applications, it can, if it doesn't get spent as contingencies, it can get rolled into a different project. So that may not work for yeah. WIC, but it might. Yeah, I mean, I think they, for me, like in terms of all the different grant organizations that I've worked with, like they are by far the easiest, the quickest, the most, they just like get it. They totally understand. And Lindsay, thank you for whatever you're doing on that side of things too. But um, they understand the nature of, of projects. And um, I think they're a good model in terms of getting DEC money just turned around really quickly and really efficiently.
I, I don't mean to have this drag on. Um, it sounds like people are saying, or some of you are saying, you think it's a good idea. Um, possible better ways to do it may involve um, dollar amounts rather than percentages, or maybe in some cases there would be floors or caps or things like that. So um, as a possible um, next step, maybe what I can propose is that this come back and you are presented with some additional information more about how uh, WUV does it and perhaps some alternatives that include uh, dollar amounts rather than percentages and things of that sort or categories. Just something more for you to chew on um, and take it a little bit further. Does that sound okay? Right, can... Yeah, I'd be really curious to uh, have an investigation of maybe cap amounts um, as and then applying percentages that way. I'd be really intrigued to see uh, something along those lines. Thank you. Great. Thanks for that discussion. And Dean, thanks for that summary. It sounds like um, maybe just you mark this for our next meeting, a little more discussion. Uh, let's see what's next. Cultural resource assessment training. Thank you. So I'm trying to unmute myself there. Um, the packets included several items having to do with this. There was a memo. And there was also an excerpt from the DEC uh, funding policy for clean water projects. Um, there were some, I think there were some flow charts that were included by mistake. You'll see some flow charts now, but they'll look different. Uh, and then there was also a copy of the historic preservation uh, form that uh, um, folks who are doing projects as part of this work are asked to use. But the overall tee, tee up for this is that it's on the this topic is on the agenda because some have been surprised to learn about the historic and cultural review requirements. Kent had made reference to uh, a map that he didn't have access to, or that uh, there is very limited public access to, and um, it it plays into what kinds of assessments are required. So it's kind of a sticky realm, um, and it may affect some of you who have applications that have approved or that you would like to have approved in the future. The topic is one that has been the subject of a presentation by staff from the Vermont Division of Historic Preservation uh, and also staff from the Vermont uh, DEC. There was a link or there is a link to that and I'm gonna to try to get that link in the chat as well so people can have it. But again, it is in the meeting packet. Um, that's That video is something that DEC, DEC staff have suggested people watch and then formulate questions that could be answered through a presentation. So rather than me going ahead and lining up a DEC speaker when I reached out to DEC, on this, uh, Gianna Petito said, start this way. Why don't you start this way? Have book members watch the video if they can. And I will say, I we have created a transcript and summary of sorts. So if you want to watch the video at double speed and, and have a set of notes from it, I will provide you with those notes. Um, but then make a list of questions if they're not answered by the material that I'm going to share today. And Gianna can come and give a presentation to you. Um, I mentioned flowcharts. This is this is a I, I asked um, Orla, who's an intern working for us this year, to do uh, a couple of uh, graphics for us. Basically, the process goes like this. You have to confirm your project type. If it's a type that isn't exempt, you have to complete the form. And then if the form says you will need to do a cultural resource assessment, you will need to do that and you will need to address your adverse impacts. 
and then get a final sign off from the Division for Historic Preservation for your project. Um, that's, that's a very gross simplification of what could be involved. Generally speaking, people are going to want to avoid having any impacts if they can, um, because it's going to complicate the development of your project. The material that was in the packet, like I said, it includes the um, excerpt from the uh, funding policy, makes it clear there's a group of projects that are exempt types. And this flow chart shows that, you know, first question is your project one of the exempt types? Uh, because if it is exempt, your life is, is much simpler. Before, earlier today, we were talking about assessment type projects and project uh, development. I should say project uh, development. Um, those are such early stage types of projects that the the burden for cultural assessment is is very limited. You don't you don't have to worry about it at that stage. Although you should certainly be thinking about it. If you're purchasing equipment, eh, we're not going to be doing that very often. But that's an exempt type. Um, illicit discharge and detective uh, detection. That's something that cities and towns that are subject to the MS4 permit have to worry about. But the ones that really come into play for many of you would be river corridor and wetland easements. If that's the type of project that you're doing, good luck. And, and not good luck, congratulations. It's an exempt type. So cultural resource assessment is not gonna be having a big impact on your life. Riparian buffer plantings, similarly, it's an exempt category. Your life is simpler. Operations and maintenance, we will be talking about that in the future. That is something, it's it's exempt, so um, we can deal with that later. But if you don't have an exempt type, then you have to start thinking through things. Um, now, there are projects that are conditionally exempt, and those, again, some of those categories don't really affect most of us, ag pollution prevention, road projects, some stormwater projects, um, and some forestry projects can be conditionally exempt. And if you establish that you meet those conditions, then again, your life will be simpler. Although I think that this is where caution is very, very important because even if you think you might be okay, there may be an instance where us a lightly colored area on a map which you think might say there's no archaeological concern it may be still enough of a concern on the part of the division for historic preservation staff that they think that there needs to be an assessment so it's it's a real uh it's a real caution the 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 conditions that someone could conceivably certify is that there's no ground disturbance beyond the footprint there's no impact on a structure that's more than 50 years old. There's no impact on any federally listed structure. Uh, the area of potential effect, and this is something that I'm not going to um, give you uh, a description of because this is really where if, if the concern ultimately involves defining areas of potential effect, this is where we would wanna have someone from the Division for Historic Preservation make a presentation. But if um, the area of potential effect is, an, is um, outside of uh, National Register historic districts, state historic districts, uh, state downtown areas, there are some designated places where there's a, a, a scrutiny of a project's potential impacts. Now, will they affect many of you in, in the majority of your projects? No, but my, my message just for you is that we have exempt first, then we have conditionally exempt. But even with those, if you think you might have qualified, you have to be very careful. Uh, and then you have everything else that would not be exempt. Um, as I said, and in which case you're gonna need to fill out that form. It's a form that comes into play when you're doing preliminary design, not just final design. I've encountered some folks who thought that they only had to deal with it at final design, not preliminary. No, my understanding is you should be using that form at preliminary design as well. That's not at, that's not at 
uh, concept design. It's not a project development, but it is after that when you're getting to the 30% stage. Um, so as I said, I'm going to try to, uh, unless someone has already put that link in, no, that's something else. Um, I will put that in the chat. As I said, try to watch the video. Uh, it is a little dry. Uh, and like I said, I can also pr uh, provide people with a with a summary or a transcript of that, which is something I have also suggested that DEC add. And so maybe by the time you go to it, you will see that they have added it also. Are there questions? I guess not. I have a question for the group. Has anyone gone through the process fully yet? Um, I have not done this exact process, but I have done um, historical and cultural reviews for the last dam removal that we did. Um, if anybody would like to talk about it a little bit, I know a thing or two. Um, and I have submitted the initial project form for this current dam removal, um, but that's as far as we've gotten. And I've gotten a quote for how much the um, ARA um, potential phase one uh, review would cost. I've done it for a couple of projects. Um... I guess three different projects and they've all been different. One was a dam removal and um, just had to do the project review form and got um, a staff member to come out and just like look and say, this is great. You can park over here. Don't park over here. It was like that simple. Another one is more like what Lauren's describing, needing like a more of a detailed review um, and including that in the budget. Um, and that was a little more complicated because we also were working with NRCS and so they were managing the historic piece for a little bit and then it, then we changed and now we're yeah anyway that was that was one of the ones where watersheds united really was able to change gears and change the budget once nrcs was no longer involved um and then another another one that was like more of a simple um project that was just like involved a phone call and a remote like review of the the plans and the site and needing to like describe the limits of disturbance for the work um and it was a pretty quick sign off so it's all been like um, I, I find the office to be like pretty easy to work with and responsive. You just sometimes have to call a couple of times and it does matter like how you classify your project, whether it needs this or not. So I have, I have come across that, like sometimes like unclear how, if a project is a floodplain project versus like a road project, um, not a floodplain, but like a, a, a stormwater versus a road, um, and whether historic preservation review needs to happen it's exempt or not in one of those either of those categories but on the one I, the the one that has the more involved thing i mean it's it's delayed the project by a year by a, a whole season so it's definitely something to like really keep um in the front of your mind and in your planning and it's uh you just have to roll with it because you can't really get around it Thank you both for those insights. That's great. Any other thoughts or concerns or questions that people want to express about these historic reviews? Okay. Dean, should we move on to? Absolutely. I can uh, get us to the to the end here. Uh, there were some things uh, included in the meeting packet that I'm going to try to demystify or clarify a little bit. They got added um, somewhat hastily. Um, and it came a bit in response to a question or comment someone had made about the um, project tracking and financial side of the work that uh, we are all doing. And I thought that it would be a good thing to do for transparency to to share that and just focus on it a little bit. Uh, there's a listing of projects that we have to update. We, the QUISP has to update quarterly and submit to DEC. 
um, as part of their tracking efforts. There are actually a couple of uh, similar tracking things that we need to do using a specific DEC developed form. Um, there was also something I could label the financial snapshot. And I will say that um, we submit at uh, the deadline for submitting certain financial things was uh, yesterday. And, and there were numbers that were updated in between the time I sent out the package and, and the final version that was submitted yesterday. So the things I'm going to show you on the screen today look a little bit different. And then I wanted to just talk touch on a little bit um, project commitments. So <clears throat> this is um, the top part of this is a portion of a form that we have to submit. Uh, it's extensive, it has many more columns and it's meant to be used throughout the life of a project. Um, the projects that have been funded by the Basin Council and the QIF so far are still early stage, but um, using this tool, it's possible to know, well, what are the formula fund um, totals? The what, What's the total amount of funding that's been awarded? And in the Missisquoi Basin prior to today, the amount of funding, and I've, and I've basically just blown up some of the columns here with the um, truncated ID numbers, but um, it's in the order of $360,000 of funding that has been put on the line for, for projects. <clears throat> and to put that into context, in the Missisquoi Basin, and hopefully I can make this make sense, um, left-hand side, award info, total award amount, $1.9 million, basically. The funding that comes from DEC to the, to the QUISPs rolls out <laughs> in um, a series of agreements. And this is the, the, the numbers that I'm showing you here are for the first agreement. And it, and it has a year, but because we have to keep spending it until it's gone before we spend other funds, we actually are gonna have a queue of agreements, but this is just the first agreement because we're so far from having spent it. It's the only one we be, need to be concerned about. But out of a total award of $1.9 million, there's a portion of it that is meant to support the work of program delivery. That's the administrative stuff. And that's $292,000. And that's that's this theoretical amount that the, the Regional Planning Commission would use to support the QUISP and the BWIC. Uh, and then there's a project completion amount that's 85%. So I just wanted people to understand 1.9 is the total, but the amount for projects is 1.65. Now, what is, what's happened is that they, DEC wants the quiz to get money in their accounts and basically have it ready to spend. And as they spend and draw down, then whatever was spent is, um, is brought back on hand. So the amount of money that the that the Quisp has um, has access to, if it's like we don't have to requisition it, it was close to seven hundred thousand dollars. That was part of the initial setup for this work. So in the event that things had just exploded out of the gate, we would have been able to drive that money to partner organizations and their contractors to do the work of that amount though the expenditures has really only been about forty six thousand dollars so most of that is on is cash on hand so i just wanted to put it you know we have this really big amount that's the total then we have a less amount that is for the projects and we haven't spent any of that but we also know that about three hundred and fifty thousand dollars of that is called for so we could in a sense reduce that number and and think about it will be spent and so if people are concerned about not having much money for other projects we're not really anywhere close to having to worry about that but we have tools like this in order to track it <clears throat> i wanted to just show people that if you want to know some of the nitty gritties there are um, again, this $46,000 expenditure, I, I've grayed out for quarters because I've tried to simplify this. Um, 
the the work of the it's frustrating because what has happened is that we have projects that are approved they're funded they aren't they aren't built yet and this is something that DEC is seeing that it's easier to get projects approved than it is to get them through completion and when Kent commented earlier about looking for ways to simplify processes this is something that really motivates us and that is to close this gap between a project getting approved for funding and then actually being able to carry it out but of the grand total the amount of money that's been spent is relatively small none of it has been spent yet on projects although we will be getting those i'm sure the next quarter we will see those expenses coming in um, and we're a long way from spending what we can spend just using year one of the funds and like i was saying at the outset we have one agreement that we call year one and we also have another agreement that's called year two which you can think of as just more of this so there's there's a there's a lot of funding available and the processes is that we create we have to find ways to make it possible to get more projects done and that's been the message since we started this um but anyway i wanted it i wanted people to have the information and i see lauren's hand is up so i'll hey, Dean. um just i think two questions hopefully i remember both of them the first one being i might just need to reread my contracts but when can project holders bill you for things um and the other one has escaped me as I knew it would. If it comes back to me, I will let you know. Sorry, I'm like so stimulated right now. Uh, so you, if um, if we have a master agreement and a task order agreement, and we have the insurance forms and the W nine, then you can you can bill. You can submit a you could submit an invoice for reimbursement if we have those things. Okay, so you don't need to like have completed part of a task or anything like that, like other grant funders. It's just really like, yep, no, we've spent this money and now I need you to pay me for it. We we did not we did not prescribe task based invoice and thing. I believe we said it could be monthly, but I'm gonna actually double check that, but you could start invoicing. Was there a second question or you just tried to remember what that was? If someone else speaks, then you'll come. Oh, okay. You remembered? Sorry. I remembered. Um, the public participation policy, I know it's so oh. not now, but just um, given this, like, hey, we don't have enough projects. Um, just wanted to bring that up now. And it's it's good that you mentioned that. And then, um, because, and maybe this takes us to the end. Um, but I, I had to make sure I um, had a chat with Catherine yesterday, but in terms of possible future agenda topics, I have this note here, public participation plan is now delayed beyond December. We had been um, advised that the Regional Planning Commission's work on its public participation plan was going to be presented in December. And because uh, there were several of us in the office who got COVID. Um, that and other things led to the RPC board not meeting um, last month, and there's also no December board meeting. So it's not. It is still in the works. I can tell you that, and I know that there's um, some kind of consultant involvement that's that's been talked about. But it's not going to be December. But we've had a conversation as recently as this week about it. And I was asked to tell everybody that it wouldn't be December, it's gonna be January or sometime later. So um, that that's my, yeah, that's what I can say about that issue. I it appreciate it, that. Um, or I will just reiterate, like we need more project <laughs> managers, <laughs> however we can get them. I think that, that needs to be a really big push. Um, 
if if there weren't questions about the the finance piece and we are moving on to possible future agenda topics um as mentioned the public participation plan won't be coming up as quickly as we thought um something that i believe i touched on in the cover memo is the adoption of completed projects the um this is an area that may represent um meaningful progress to some folks. The CRISP funds are available to build things and also to operate and maintain them for the long term or for their life. Um, so one of the, um, I, the reason that this chart is here is to explain to people that clean water service providers and the basin councils have a role in operation and maintenance and it's been mapped out and it's this really complicated chart, but I've zoomed in on a part of it just to hopefully make it a little bit clear. I've got this red box around a part of this chart that is under- Hey Dean, I don't think you're sharing. Ah. Well, thank you, Maddie. Um, so this is the big ugly chart that shows all of operations and maintenance. And this is the part of it that is relevant. And that is, Quisp and Bwix can identify projects for adoption. So what does that mean? It means there's a project that has been completed at some point in the not too distant past that has a phosphorus benefit that maybe is posing a burden to some organization that completed it because they were told that they had to operate and maintain it for some period of years, but they didn't get any extra funding for it. It would be possible for the Basin Council and the CWISP to adopt those projects, which would mean that dollars could flow to that project for its op ongoing operations and maintenance. And so this is something that um, has been, I'll say, slow to develop on the DEC side and the CWISP side in terms of policy and what's the best way to do it, because there are some intricacies about crediting phosphorus. But um, it could be that we will have enough material and useful stuff to go on to have a conversation. And I just wanted to illustrate this, try to make it real by showing, so you are all aware of the Watershed Project database. Earlier today, I, or yeah, earlier, I went to the project database and I chose project types, and this is a list and you can't see all of them, but there are implementation projects. So I don't wanna see things that aren't like in the ground type projects. Um, for the Missisquoi Basin that have been funded or that are pending closeout, and I said, generate a report. And this is, um, this is most of them. And it's a, it's a, it's a group of possibilities. Now, I haven't spent time analyzing whether any of these, first of all, um, have good phosphorus performance or lack operation and maintenance funds, but this is the kind of exercise that the Basin Council and the QUISP could go through to perhaps find one or two or, or more projects. It would say, that's a good project for us to adopt we're going to make sure it has a um, a good, long, useful life because we can direct funds to operate and maintain it. And we're going to be able to add it to our our book, so to speak, for phosphorus crediting. I just wanted to preview that as a topic. I've done so in the past, but I think we're getting closer to the point where the group could have a meaning to, meaningful discussion about what kinds of projects would be the best projects to go after. And of course, if there's any any other topic that anyone would like to suggest, in the, please let let us know. Great, thanks, Dean. Um, and yeah, just to reiterate, <clears throat> Dean does a great job of creating these agendas, and then ping some to Kent and I to get any feedback, but we're just two people. So if you have thoughts or topics or 
um, you know, I, I was really excited when Dean was like, how about some cultural assessment talk? You know, these conversations are always good to have in a group setting. So please do send ideas and don't hesitate to reach out to Dean, myself, Kent, any of us, and we'll make sure they come up at the next meeting. Any final thoughts or questions or um, concerns that people want to make sure are heard by the group? not we can close out a little early um thank you guys for good discussion for the votes for attending so that we have a quorum um i will take a motion to adjourn so moved okay that's from beth is there a second to adjourn kent is seconding okay raise hands if you're ready to take off i've got kent lindsay Blair, Dan, Lauren, Barry, Beth. Great. <laughs> Everybody's in agreement. Thank you guys very much and enjoy the rest of your Wednesday.